All right, so we're there in uh, Isaiah chapter 8. Um, we'll read verse 12. So say, sorry, verse 13. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall, and be broken, and be snared, and be taken. So the title of my sermon tonight is Stumbling Blocks to Salvation. Um, so we've read there in Isaiah chapter 8, um, but now we're going to be talking about a false works gospel or work salvation, which is something that we commonly come across, uh, especially those who go out soul winning. Um, and that's, that just means to be trusting in your works and not in Jesus' works. When he died on the cross, he went to hell for three days and three nights, you know, while the world rested on those Sabbath days. And these stumbling stones can come in many forms, and we're going to cover a couple of them tonight. So we'll get you to turn to Luke chapter 18. We're going to go to the story of the rich young ruler. So we'll start in verse 18. I'll read down to verse 25. It says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these things have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, You lackest, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So what we get from this is the rich young ruler calls Jesus good master, but when he, Christ admonishes him, um, he says only God is good. You know, and the rich young ruler goes on to say, Well, I'm good because I've kept all the commandments from, from my youth. Um, now, we know Jesus Christ is good. Now, Jesus also knows 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So he answers him by saying that if you've kept all the commandments and you're good, then sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have riches in heaven and come and follow me. So be a disciple of Christ. Give up everything you have. Um, but he couldn't do that. It was a stumbling block for him. And Jesus knew that. Um, and he also knew that he'd not kept the law as he claimed to do. So we'll turn to Matthew 19. He gives us another perspective of this same story. We'll read verses 16 to 24. It says in verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that's God. But if thou wilt enter into life, Keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which? And Jesus, Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honour thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. And the young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the man heard this saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So, and what does Jesus do here? He does what we see in Titus 3 verse 10 and 11 a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So Christ didn't try to actually correct his belief that he's justified by keeping the law. Um, the rich young ruler believed that he'd kept it perfectly, and Jesus knew that was not the case. But he was condemned of himself, and in his mind was justified by his own works. And he stumbled at two things here. One of them was his riches, 
and the other one was his works. He was righteous in his own eyes. So there in verse 23 it says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. So the rich will stumble at the free gift of salvation. Um, those who are covetous, which the Bible actually calls idolatry in Colossians 3.5, they find it difficult to accept the free gift of eternal life, um, which somebody else has paid for. And we see it often while preaching the gospel. Um, their God is whatever they happen to covet, whether it be money, mammon, possessions, you know, another person or anything like that. That's their own God. Um, and that's a stumbling stone, and it can actually be offensive to them, the free gift of eternal life. And, you know, the world often thinks that something that's good cannot be free, and something that's free cannot be good. You know, but they could not be more wrong when it comes to eternal life. Um, we'll turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. And we'll read verses 1 to 9. It says in verse 1, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the very seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that thou they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thine understanding thou hast gotten thee riches." and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. And by great wisdom and by the traffic thou hast increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of the riches. Therefore said, thus said the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness." They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. So, you know, another stumbling block, sorry, the heart's lifted up because of riches of their own wisdom and beauty. Um, and the chapters, it's both about the king of Tyrus, but it's also about Lucifer. If you read down further, it actually describes the, the, ch the cherub who was given all these instruments and things in his body um, and was also, you know, in the Garden of Eden is what it explains there. That has, how we know it's speaking about Lucifer as well. Um, but it's obvious, you know, it's obvious when you read it down, but um, you can see the hearts full of covetousness and wickedness um, and the end is the pit, which is hell. That's the end for these people who covet such things and who love money more than God. Uh, and they're not able to, be to believe because these are stumbling blocks, this money and, and themselves being their own God, even having the pride to say, well, I am God, standing in front of God. I mean, just how wicked is that? Um, we'll turn to, uh, to Romans chapter 8 and look at another stumbling block, which is misunderstanding of the new man or the new creature which is a it is a big stumbling block for a lot of people we see it we, every time we go out door to door we we encounter people who say you know well you, you can't just live however you want and things like that not understanding that yes we have the new man but we still have the old man so we'll read verses 1 to 9 of uh, Romans chapter 8 it says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, though if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
So the dual nature of a man that comes with salvation is another stumbling block, sometimes to getting saved, but even to people's understanding. You know, the flesh cannot be brought into subjection to the law. And many twist or misunderstand this scripture, um, you know, to say that if you sin, you're not saved, or even say that you can lose your salvation if you're doing certain sins. And what they stumble at is that there's a duality of the saved believer. There's the old man and the new creature. There's one who cannot stop sinning. The other is born of God, and it's the seed of God, and it cannot sin. You know, so that while the carnal mind cannot be brought into subjection of the law, you know, the new man is always in subjection to the law. So, and they're just people who are trusting in their own righteousness. You know, and what does the scripture say? How are we justified? So we'll turn to Titus chapter 3. We'll read verses 4 to 7. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So how are we justified? It's by the grace of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where your hope should be if you're saved. Um, turn to Matthew chapter 12. We'll start in verse 31. It says, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know, and how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So your words are what will condemn you, whether you're trusting your works or whether you're trusting in Jesus Christ. And those who are believed will confess the Lord Jesus on that day. And those who are trusting in their works will be condemned and cast out. So just turn back to Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew chapter 7. We'll just read those two verses here. They're pretty famous. Everyone, I think, knows them. <laughs> but uh, it's verses uh, 22 and 23. It says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So what are these people doing? I mean, they have such pride, like, like we also saw in Ezekiel 8, uh, 28. Um, they have such pride that they dare to glorify themselves in the presence of God. And... You know, I know we don't get our doctrine from hymns, but I love that hymn, Saved by Grace. You know, in the chorus it says, And I shall see him face to face and tell the story, Saved by Grace. And, you know, this is what our response should be on that day when we're standing face to face with the Lord. Is, you know, what are, what are these people doing? They're saying, look, I'm saved because, you know, I prophesied in your name. I cast out devils. I've done many wonderful works. They're puffing themselves up in the presence of God. And what, what are we to do? Just say, tell the story, say, by grace. You know, so if your answer does not glorify Jesus Christ, but rather glorifies yourself, as these men do, you do not understand salvation by grace. So we'll turn to Romans chapter 14. We'll read verse 11 to 12. says here for it is written as i liveth saith the lord 
Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So these guys aren't going to get away with it. They're going to stand before the Lord at some point. Every person is going to stand before the Lord. But see, as say believers, we're going to stand before him and worship him and glorify him and say, you saved us. Thank you. Whereas these people are going to be so puffed up, they're just going to be glorifying themselves, saying, well, I deserve to be here because of how good I am. And they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. You know, so we're just, but we're also justified by our words of faith, not our works. So for out of the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And I do like it in verse 12, that every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And that's what you confess out of your heart. It's not just out of your lips, because you can't fool God. He knows what's in your heart. You know, and Jesus Christ kept the law perfectly, and he being God was able to do that. You know, but the scriptures make it very clear that we cannot. We'll turn to Matthew chapter 5. Most people know, again, it's the Beatitudes, very famous passage of scripture. We'll read verse, uh, starting verse 18. It says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle in no wise shall pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, in James 2.10, he puts it this way, that whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. You know, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, this is why Jesus came to be the propitiation for our sins, you know, so that we could trust in him and receive his righteousness. So, and it's not possible for us to keep the law perfectly. You know, even one sin makes us guilty of the whole law. And that's just one lie makes you guilty and worthy of the lake of fire. So we'll, uh, we'll continue in, in uh, chapter 5, we'll read from verse 21 to 28, because he's saying, he goes on to describe what it means to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. You know, um, so where is it? Verse 21. So you have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. And, uh, sorry, then we'll skip and go down to verse, um, verse 27. Um, you have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You know, so again, we just see that we're all under sin according to God's standard. Um, Romans 3 verse 9 says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20, it says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There's never been a just man upon the earth save for Jesus Christ himself. You know, so you just, uh, we'll turn to Romans chapter 3 and we'll read uh, from verse 19. So it says, Now we know that what, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. You know, and verse 19 is key, key here. It, the law makes us guilty before God. You know, with James 2.10 in mind, if you offend in one point, you're guilty of the whole law. And the purpose isn't to save, but to bring the world to repentance. 
to believe on Jesus Christ and be washed clean in his blood, to have all your sins remitted and no longer imputed unto you. And this is what it means to be righteous in the sight of God. And we can say that about the new man. He is righteous, but it's a stumbling block for many who do not understand that. So, And Israel also stumbled after their own righteousness because they sought it by the law and not by faith. Romans chapter 9, so just flip over a few pages to Romans chapter 9. We'll read uh, verse 29. It said, And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodoma and as made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. So how do we attain it? We attain it by faith. How did they fail to obtain it? Because they sought it not by faith, but by their own works. Read uh, Romans 11. So that should just be over. And verse 1 to 7. It says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Isaiah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars. I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so, then, at this present time, there is also a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not attained, obtained that which he seeketh, seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. You know, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes they should not see, and ears they should not hear unto this day, which you'll actually find in Psalm 69. Um, turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. But this is the thing, that Jesus is a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And he's either going to be your foundation, if you believed, or he will be your destruction in the judgment. So 1 Peter chapter 2, read verse 1 to 10. It says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offence, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were also appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which, hath, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy." So take note in verse 8, it says, you know, they were disobedient, um, whereunto they also were appointed. They stumbled at the word. So, you know, they were given the prophets and uh, even the apostles in the New Testament. They were also given the scriptures. They were disobedient and did not believe the Lord. So there was always a remnant, but as a nation, Israel was rejected because, you know, they stumbled at that stumbling stone. 
of the Lord and the word of God. They rejected the word and they were rejected because they rejected the word. Romans 2, verse 7 and 8, it says, To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. So for those of us who seek after the Lord and we love his word and we love his law, you know, we have eternal life. But to those who are contentious, they do not obey the truth. You know, indignation and wrath. Is, is what's in store for them. Um, turn to Galatians chapter 3. We'll read verses uh, 1 to 6. It says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you would not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, ye are now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you in the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So is it by works or faith? It can only be one or the other. It can't be a mixture of the two. You know, so consistently we see it's by faith alone. Obeying the truth is the same as believing the record in 1 John chapter 5. You know, and we will get to that later. Um, in Acts 5 verse 32 it says, And we are his witnesses of these things, so, and so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. So the Holy Ghost is given to those who obey God. You know, and how do you receive the Holy Ghost? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and being born again. That's how you receive the Holy Ghost. It has absolutely nothing to do with your own works, but everything to do with repentance from dead works and a faith towards God, as it says in Hebrews chapter 6. And, you know, I recently heard a preacher put it this way. In James 2, it says that faith without works is dead. You know, so faith without works is dead faith. Um, so what is dead works? Well, it's works without faith, is dead works. You know, so to repent and believe the gospel means you need to repent of whatever works you have and just believe on Christ. So any, any kind of works, whether it be repenting of your sins, whether it be baptism, whether it be being a good person, a false god, whatever your works are, you need to repent of that and just believe Jesus Christ. So turn to Romans chapter 10. And we'll start in verse 16. It says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, the sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and said, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he said, all day long have I stretched forth my hand unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. So when it comes to those who justify themselves by their works and not by their faith in Jesus Christ, they're referred to as disobedient in the Bible. You know, and often... Uh, also, they're disobedient and gainsaying. You know, they speak against the word of God as well, you know, as well as not believing it. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, you don't have to turn there, I'll read that to you, verse 2 to 5. But it says, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace he has saved. So again, they contrasted, the children of disobedience are contrasted with us, who are quickened with Christ, means we've received the Holy Ghost, our spirit is now alive, 
But these people who are disobedient, their spirit is still dead. And re remember in Romans 9.33 it says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offence. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. In Isaiah 45.17 it says, But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. Therefore thus, sorry, Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. But what did it say? It said that those who believe on Christ, to him he is the precious stone. He's not precious to those who don't believe in him. So these Jews, this nation of Israel that didn't believe in him, it's not precious to them. He's not their foundation stone. He's actually a stone of stumbling. And in Isaiah chapter 8, as we read before, it says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. You know, so why would he be a stone of stumbling? Because they, they, you know, as we've read, they sought righteousness through the law and not by faith. And by seeking it through the law, you will stumble and you will fall. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, uh, you can turn there if you like. Um, we'll be moving pretty quickly through some of these. So. Um, Jeremiah 6, verse 18. It says, Therefore hear ye nations and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. To what purpose cometh here to, my in to me incense from Sheba, and the sweet cane for a from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet unto me. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will lay a stumbling block before this people, and the fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them, the neighbor and his friend shall perish. And uh, turn to Matthew 21. So we'll read verse 42 to 45. So as Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. And they knew that he spoke of them, you know, but their reaction wasn't to just believe on him, that he is the Son of God, but their reaction was actually to cast him out and to kill him. You know, so we see that even Jesus himself and the Gospel of Christ are stumbling stones unto the Jews and Gentiles alike. You know, those who were not found in Christ will be destroyed at his coming and at the judgment. Uh, we find that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Where it says, uh, so yeah, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall thy wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the workings of Satan, with all power and signs and wonders. So we come now to the next one, which is stumbling at the work of your own hands. Now, Cain and Abel is a perfect example of that. In fact, it's the first example we have of somebody trusting in their own works. And the Bible has nothing nice to say about Cain. Uh, so turn to uh, Genesis chapter 4. We'll just read quickly the story of Cain and Abel. It says, And Adam knew his, Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare her, his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord, 
And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt, not they, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with, his, with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. You know, so Cain stumbled at the commandment to offer a sacrificial lamb. You know, he refused to offer the sacrifice which God commanded, but rather, and that, that was a picture of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, um, but he, he wanted to offer the works of his own hands, the vegetables and fruits that he'd worked, but that was not acceptable to God. In Hebrews 11.4 it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So Abel was righteous in the eyes of God. But why was that? It's because he believed the Lord and offered a sacrifice according to what the Lord had said. Um, but Cain was rejected because he ignored the commandment of God and tried to please him with the works of his own hands. You know, and this is what every person who believes in work salvation is trying to do. You know, and what did it say in Romans 8? That without faith it's impossible to please God. And this is why in 1 John chapter 3 it says about Cain... Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So Abel was a righteous child of God, while it says his brother Cain was of the devil. And the difference being that Abel believed the Lord, and offered the sacrifice according to the commandment, while his brother Cain trusted in the works of his own hands, and he killed his brother when it was found not to be acceptable. And it was just wicked to do that, to have a heart that wicked. Uh, and God's very specific about what's required for salvation. You know, there's only one, one way, it's God's perfect way, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Not offering the works of your own hands, repenting of your sins, baptism, any other works of your own hands. It's an everlasting gospel which God promised before the world began. And that Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it was always determined that Christ would die and we would receive eternal life through him. In John uh, chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So there's no other way but the way God commanded in his word. And that's repent and believe the gospel. So what's my point tonight? My point is that we're to shine the light of the gospel to light the path of salvation for those who stumble in the darkness. You know, those who after having the light of the gospel shine on them and they still stumble at these things, these people are already subverted. You know, and what we learn from Christ and from Titus 3.10 is if they're unreceptive and even after you've shown them they still stumble at these things, then you uh, give them two admonitions, shake the dust off your feet and move on to the next house or village. You know, so there are some things people will stumble at according to the scriptures. One of them, of course, is their false works gospel, Cain and Abel and the rich young ruler. You've got wrongly defining repentance, which I've covered in another sermon. But this is, a, this is the stumbling block, again, to those who want to trust in their own works. There's people who will not hearken to the word of God, who do not believe the scriptures, and they do not believe the record that God gave of his son. Um, people who desire signs and miracles. You know, it says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no sign be given but that of the prophet Jonas. So we know as Jesus Christ went to hell for three days and three nights, that's the, that's the only sign we have is the gospel that he died and rose again from the dead. That's the only sign and miracle that we have. It's the only one we need. And there's also, you know, doing what's right in your own eyes. In, like in Ezekiel 28, where you are your own God and you just worship yourself. But there are also three specific things that you must believe to be saved. And these are three stumbling blocks to salvation. 
And we find those in 1 John chapter 5. So we'll get you to turn there. So it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, that's the Holy Ghost. It says, He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Verse 11, and this is the record. So this is the truly important bit, what we need to believe to be saved. It says that God hath given to us eternal life, and that this life is in his Son. So the first thing you must believe is that it's a gift. You know, and this is something that the rich are going to stumble at all the time. It's a free gift. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Romans 6.23, of course, we all know this as well, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the second thing we must believe also is that it's eternal life or everlasting life. So this is your once saved, always saved, eternal security of the believer, whatever you want to call it. But this is a stumbling block to those who trust in themselves and their own works. John 10, 28 says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John three eighteen says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. To Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And First John 2.25, And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. So and the third thing that we must believe is that it's through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and him alone. And this is mostly a stumbling block for those of other religions, whom they may have another Jesus, or uh, you know, they may be trusting in themselves, or their works. Um, but we also see this with this certain group of people who believe Jesus is the Father and ridiculous things like that. You know, you cannot believe in another Jesus. You must believe in the Jesus of the Bible, that God was manifest in the flesh and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So 1 John 2.22 Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. 1 John 4, 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus, is come, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And that this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. 2 John 1 verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Acts 4.10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is a stone which was set at naught of you builders which has become the head of the corner neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved first john 5 5 who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that jesus is the son of god second corinthians 11 verse 4 for if he that cometh preacheth another jesus whom you have not preached or if you receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted you might well bear with him first timothy 2 5 for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 1 John 4, 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. 
1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. In 1 John 5, 20. And we know that the Son of God has come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So if someone rejects any of these points, they are not saved and have made God a liar. Because this is the record you must believe to be saved. And it's also important that when we're out preaching the gospel, that we make sure they understand all these three points and they believe all three points. You know, and it doesn't matter what you believed in the past. What matters is today, if you believe in your heart that salvation is a free gift, that it's everlasting and eternal life, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who paid for it all on the cross, then you're saved. And the purpose of the sermon is this. If we fail to shine the light of the gospel, we're causing the lost to stumble and condemning their souls to hell. And our job as soul winners is to shine that glorious light of the gospel to give hope to those who stumble in the darkness of this wicked world. Do you, do you mind praying for me, Brother Jason?